Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, the Secretary gives an update on the rural economy. Moving grain downriver gets a boost from Congress. And market analysis with Angie Setzer and Chris Swift, next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing, store now, profit later. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, January 21 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. January is named after Janus, the god of beginnings and transitions. However, higher prices and bottlenecks continue to dominate the economic landscape in rural America. Despite inflated lumber prices and supply chain shortages, housing starts for 2021 we're up 15.6% year over year. The construction of single family units rose 13.4% in the same time frame. Existing home sales dropped 4.6% in December as would be buyers appeared frustrated over lack of available homes. The number of houses for sale last month fell to 910,000, the fewest since records began in 1999. Creighton's rural Main Street index declined but remained above growth neutral for the 14th consecutive month. Bank CEOs in rural areas cited rising input prices as the top farm threat in 2022. Now, the Secretary of Agriculture was called into Congress this week to give his take on the state of the rural economy. Peter Tubbs reports. This week, Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack appeared before a virtual hearing of the House Agriculture Committee. Biofuels, trade, and meatpacking were popular topics. The cost of uh, food at the grocery store, <laughs> I'm getting hammered with that in the district. This is basically strong demand, and as I uh, indicated earlier, strong demand globally and nationally. Uh, and essentially we're changing our patterns of how we eat and where we eat. Uh, and the supply chain is in the process of adjusting to the fact we're eating more at home and less out in restaurants. Will you commit to supporting biofuels like ethanol, which are crucial to corn growers in rural America? Congressman, I don't have to commit, we are doing that. And the reality is I can, I've got 800 million reasons why we're doing that. $800 million provided the biofuel industry in terms of support during the pandemic, as well as $100 million to expand access to higher blends, uh, the ability to have consumers have access to higher blends, uh, 65 waivers that might have been granted in the Trump administration that were denied by the CPA, a record amount uh, of, of, of volume for 2022 under the RFS. I think it is very unfair to suggest that this administration has not been supportive of the biofuel industry. It feels like China sold America Bill of Goods and that Biden administration has made no effort to rectify the situation. Well, you can tell folks that people are, that there is an ongoing negotiation with China. Uh, I don't know where your figures are coming from, but my figures say that they are $16 billion light. Um, and they are also light on seven very important sanitary and phytosanitary barriers. And so we are giving uh, China, we're putting them on notice that th this is something that we want them to live up to the phase one agreement. Uh, we want our Mexican friends to live up to USMCA. We want our Canadian friends to live up to U USMCA. We want our trading partners to live up to agreements. I just uh, really push back on uh, these new GYPSA rules uh, as strongly as I possibly can. F farmers deserve a fair shake in the marketplace, and they don't get a fair shake. They do not get a fair shake in the marketplace. Poultry producers are not, 
are not given a fair shake in the tournament system. It's not transparent. Uh, so this is about fundamental fairness. It's about giving farmers a fair shake. And you know what? That's the I think that's the department's business. That's, a, that's our role, is to make sure that we're giving farmers a fair shake, number one. Number two, it's important to expand capacity. When 85% of beef processing is in the hands of four companies, when 70% of pork processing is in the hands of four companies, when you know, over 50% of poultry processing is in the hands of four co companies, it, it's simply too concentrated. There's not enough capacity and there's not enough competition. And frankly, if we had more competition, we'd give consumers choice. And if, if consumers have choice, I guarantee you that's also going to impact and affect price in a positive way. From market to market, I'm Peter Tubbs. The effort to fix locks and dams along the Mississippi River picked up steam this week. Press releases went out from those who voted for and against the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, highlighting projects in their districts. One that caught the attention of those in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Missouri, and Iowa is the $732 million set aside for Lock and Dam 25. Here's John Torpy. Locks and dams along the nation's inland waterways that are in need of upgrading and repair received a much needed shot in the arm this week. On Thursday, the Army Corps of Engineers released its spending plans for 2022. In total, nearly $23 billion has been earmarked for repairs and improvements for the nation's ports and inland waterways. The funds came from the Federal Infrastructure and Jobs Act of 2021 and USDA's portion of money released through the Disaster Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2022. One project Army Corps officials have picked for improvements is Lock and Dam 25, located in Winfield, Missouri. The 600-foot Lower Mississippi River Lock will expand to 1,200 feet, dramatically increasing lock-through times for shippers moving grain down the water superhighway. The price tag for the project is expected to hit just over $732 million. Last December, several soybean farmer associations offered the federal government $1 million to help jumpstart improvement work on Lock and Dam 25. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Next, the Market to Market Report. A movement of troops to the border between Russia and Ukraine had the attention of the grain traders in the United States. For the week, the nearby wheat contract added 37 cents, while March corn improved 20 cents. South America's changing weather patterns and predictions of crop damage created volatility in the soy complex. The March soybean contract improved 45 cents. March meal shed 12.90 per ton. March cotton expanded by 98 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, February Class 3 milk futures declined to $1.58. A mixed week in the livestock sector. February cattle lost a nickel. March feeders cut 308. And the February lean hog contract strengthened by 530. In the currency markets, U.S. dollar index increased 44 ticks. March crude oil gained $1.66 per barrel. COMEX Gold added 15.30 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index improved almost 17 points to finish at 609.40. Let's welcome in now two of our regular market analysts. One would be Angie Setzer. The other is Chris Swift. Hello to the both of you. Chris, I'm going to start with you. And Angie, I'm going to ask you the same question. What's the biggest, I'll say, hang-up weight on commodities in general right now as we sit here in uh, mid to late January? Seems like the transportation and distribution channels have, have been messed up in just about every single aspect of, of moving product across the United States and from our rail, from our shipyards to our railheads and then to our trucks to get it to the actual place of business. The, the downtimes are incredible. The restrictions that are placed upon a lot of these are really causing most of this. So we're really not seeing much in shortages of the actual product, just the inability to get it from where it needs to, from where it is to where it needs to be. All right, Angie, same question to you. He says transportation. Your answer is? I agree with Chris, although I'll use family feud style rules and not take You have his to pick answer. a different answer, right? <laughs> I have it. to, yeah. Uh, I would say this, how China manages their zero COVID policy as we move ahead, obviously we've seen Omicron 
um, you know, across the globe has really kind of created this huge surge in cases. And then we've seen things kind of mellow out and move on, you know, how that works in China and what we see happen after the Olympics is something I'm really going to be watching. You know, as it, we've already seen it, we had one positive case of Omicron in an office building in Beijing last week, and they locked down the office building. No one got to go home. So it'll be interesting to see just how they proceed and what that does to overall demand plus supply, the ability to unload um, ships at port, you know, all of these things. So I, I think it probably just kind of exacerbates the, the transportation issue, uh, but it's definitely something I'm, I'm watching. Uh, Angie, is there one specific commodity that concerns you, uh, say soybeans with China, if a, a, a big breakout happens there? Well, yeah, I would think soybeans uh, could cause an issue. I mean, there's been a lot of conversation that the the reduction in restaurant eating has already taken place. We saw that happen in December with a large percentage down. And what we've seen, you know, it, it early on in COVID was the reduction in restaurant eating and some of that really kind of made the Chinese population transition away from maybe more in the way of meat to, to that of a diet of, of maybe more poultry, noodles, things of that nature, which is part of the reason we've seen their wheat demand increase so much. Um, but obviously, you know, soybeans are the obvious answer. And then corn, you know, simply because I feel like we have this large amount of risk premium just kind of lurking in the market with the idea that China is going to swoop in and start buying up all, all of this extra corn. Um, so I'm definitely watching both corn and soybeans when it comes to that. And I think wheat demand continues to increase because they've discovered how delicious bread and noodles are. And there's no going back from that. All right, you're, you're, you're teasing wheat. I want to go back to soybeans and finish that discussion about uh, the other big story. And that's the varying weather reports in South America. There's reports that enough rain fell, not enough rain fell, the crop is damaged, the crop is great. Where do you see things right now in South America when it comes to soybeans? All of the above. I, I mean, I think that's one of the important things we have to, to think about is, is the Brazilian or the South American growing region is up and down. You know what I mean? So we have a very widespread um, sort of maturity sort of phase in, in growth that takes place. You know, you obviously you have Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso and points to the north that started planting in September, while Rio Grande do Sol, Argentina, you know, they just planted or are just wrapping up on planting. And, and so you have um, some instances where we could see some of these rains really kind of save or at least cap that damage that we've been seeing. Other areas, obviously, it's it's too little too late. They planted early this year because we thought the monsoonal moisture was going to kick in. And so you've seen that big reduction. And so the million dollar question becomes how much does the North offset the South? Because the North did have nearly ideal um, growing conditions. And, and so here we sit. Um, you know, most of the folks in the know that are down there that, that are working with folks down that way are still in that upper 137, 139. Now, granted, that's a heck of a lot lower than where we were at the 145 to 150, you know, sort of uh, potential level that we were sitting at. So it is something that that is definitely we're going to continue to watch it. What I find most intriguing right now is the Brazilian farmer, you know, taking after the the U.S. farmer to a certain extent in the sense that they sold too much last year. They were almost 60 percent sold by this point in the growing season last year, only to watch the market surge up another dollar, two dollars. This year, they're below average on sales, and that's kind of causing some issues with the cash market now. They've definitely shut off sales as the, the market started to trade higher, and these drought talk, the drought talk has come into play. And so that's influenced basis. It's brought some business back to the U.S. It's helped kind of support this thing. But we're only about 2% harvested. So we'll see here in another four or five weeks. We'll get a better feel for what's taking place. But so far, you have zero and you have hero when it comes to, <laughs> to yield reports out of, out of South America, out of Brazil especially. So we'll see which one wins when we get to the end. Let's look at the board. Zero and hero are both up on there. Very good. Chris, uh, from a livestock producer's perspective, when they look at the corn market, what's their initial reaction right now? Um, a little bit of shell shock, simply because nobody has had an opportunity so far to reload at a new production cycle at any lower prices. We ended up this year uh, in December with some of the higher prices for corn, and now we're ending some cycles. We're, we're finishing off our wintertime cycle and fixing to go into a more springtime cycle, and we'll still need some of those products. And, and we're just finding that there's been no break whatsoever for our producers to, to replenish those uh, in inputs that we need. And so if you are someone who needs the corn, do you have to bite the bullet and make a purchase right now? 
Well, you know what we're looking at right now, if you can wait, it's always cheaper in the back end right now. We had a full inverted market today where the March contract traded the highest price. And uh, again, it, you would like to be able to go out and buy some of the cheaper grain in the future, but we know that these cycles are ending. Nobody has been able to buy grain at a cheaper price. So they're just having to come back and reload those feed bins again with the highest price corn there is. Angie, when you hear inversion and you look at the December corn contract on the screen now, 565 and a quarter, we're over $6 in the March. It's mm -hmm. January, for heaven's sakes. Does, where's this go? Higher? Oh, well, it could. I mean, I think at this point, yeah, the path of least resistance or at least the risk is, is to the high side. We're in a full-blown bull market here, right? We have been now for, what, a year, 14 months, 15 months. You know, and, and when we were trading at the low side, I, I can remember always telling my customers, okay, you have to realize that unknowns tend to always be bearish in this current market structure, right? Like market psychology always wins. Well, now we're in a bull market. And so our unknowns are, are bullish. Does China step in? Does Russia attack Ukraine and reduce the amount of, of global corn stocks? Does the drought continue in Argentina and reduce production? You know, we're, we're not really of the mindset yet that it's like, okay, well, these are reasons that we're going to see supply increase or demand slow down. It's it's still the, the opposite. Um, you know, and, and so you look at it and you think, does it continue higher? And, and right now, I would say the signs point to yes. But if you look at the outside markets and you look at some of these other stories, if we don't see things line up, you know, I, I read earlier today someone using their, their private estimate of 1.2 billion bushels, you know, of, of corn ending stocks versus the USDA at 1.54. You know, okay, if that is the truth, then we should be uh, $657 and heavily inverted. If it is truly 1.5 or 1.6 or 1.7, if we don't see China take in everything that they have purchased from a corn export standpoint, and, and we potentially see feed demand maybe back off a scotch, even though Catalan feed, not to steal Chris's numbers, doesn't show that's going to happen. I mean, there's a lot of ways that we could back off. But until we know more about what's going to happen with Russia, Ukraine, the, the Brazilian crop and, and Chinese demand, we're going to stay supported at the very least, if not try to move higher. The open interest indicates money is flowing into commodities as well. Mm, and still. we know better than to, to get in their way. OK, so let's let's go to wheat now. Uh, you mentioned Ukraine and Russia. I mean, this is uh, geopolitical in many re reasons. China, same thing. But this wheat market, uh, it's also cold in the plains. And so what is the, what are those the two biggest factors in the market right now, Angie? In wheat? I would say, yeah, I think the biggest factors in the market right now is that the continued increase in Chinese demand, the fact that we did see such a reduction in production last summer in the Northern hemisphere, both in Russia and in, in the US and Canada. Um, and so we still kind of have that long tail of the short crop of, of 2021 that's that, that's going to hang over our heads. And then the Russia-Ukraine thing is huge. You can't have two of the top world exporters, you know, kind of running into a situation where there's a conflict and not have some sort of risk premium put into place. You know, traders remember 2014, the last time we saw an actual full-on uh, conflict between both countries, wheat rallied 20%. Now, a lot of things are different now than what they were then, but it's something that you you maintain in the back of your mind. And, and until we feel better about what's taking place, whether Putin's just working to, to challenge the West and, and see how far he can go, or if he truly is intending on, you know, not only uh, having the incursion actually going through with the full on invasion, until we know more about that, you know, you really have to keep that risk premium in place because what happens if you lose, you know, that large supply of, of, of world wheat when we're already, I mean, we're already worried about food scarcity and now we're talking about the potential of limiting exports out of two of the top exporters, like I said, it's going to keep the market supported. And then obviously weather comes into play probably here in another couple, three months. All right. So Chris, if I'm with my livestock right now and hearing what Angie just talked about with the grains and I know what you watch with the grains, which is one of the three that we just mentioned that I need to pay the closest attention to, or at least the story that I need to see to, to figure out how to make decisions that benefit me. 
Well, today, right now, probably wheat more than anything. We, we have heard over the last couple of weeks that more cattle are being pulled off of wheat pasture simply because of the deterioration in the crop. And we find out today that we've got a 6% increase in our placement number. And we have to believe that a lot of that increase is due to that factor. We've been running at fairly normal placements. We have believed all year long that we've whittled down the cattle market considerably. We've been placing more heifers. We've been slaughtering more cows. And then yet we come up with a 6% increase of placements and that is pretty much primarily due to that wheat pasture and it going backwards having to pull those cattle off early more than likely that'll run all the way in through january but then what that really does is when we get into the march april time frame when those really good nine weights would be coming off of that wheat, they won't be here well in reading you the last couple of weeks all of this year you felt a little more bullish about cattle but something changed here uh you've kind of talked about it a little bit Live cattle, you concerned? Are we in a bear market yet? No, because we just set contract highs within this month. So it's, it's not that we're in a bear market, nor do I think that we have a bear market environment, but we've got an outcrop in this wall of worry that kind of popped up over the last couple of weeks. And uh, between the transportation and distribution issues, we've got another snowstorm coming into the Northeast. The restaurant issue is really horrific. So with backing up the, the cattle market and backing up some of this inability to move those cattle, I think what we're going to see is maybe just a little bit of some of the premium that's been in the futures market kind of bleed out some. The secretary in the piece earlier tonight uh, talked about that uh, shift in consumer again. A couple of theories. Uh, maybe this virus has peaked in Europe, maybe has peaked now in the United States. Uh, is there any optimism there, Chris, that uh, maybe things get better for the restaurant industry? Or is this just back to what it was in early 2020 in the, in the virus that everything went to the grocery store? Uh, I have to believe that the uh, ten tenacity of the U.S. Uh, businessman is going to, they're going to want to uh, reopen every restaurant that they possibly can. Uh, they have been backwards for several months now. Uh, we know they need a lot of help in, in both ways, reducing the food prices, helping to get those distribution channels open where the fresh vegetables and fruits can come into those restaurants. And so if we look at it going forward, we've, we've had a cyclical change in the production. We're, we're killing more cows. We're placing more heifers. So what we're really doing is liquidating in a very small amount, and we're waiting for this spring. And, and this spring will be the turn as to whether we continue to liquidate or whether we actually go into some type of mild expansion. And we all tend to know what happens when we go into mild expansion. We pull all those cows and heifers back onto the farm again. And we'll make an instantaneous shortage of cattle to the beef market. <laughs> if it isn't one thing, it's another. Let's quickly get Absolutely. in hogs here before, <laughs> before we get to another question into Angie uh, that, that someone sent in from Colorado. Chris, I want to ask you, hogs, a good week for them. What is driving that rally? It, it seems to be that there are fewer market-ready hogs. This is about the only thing that I have heard of so far. And that market has been very, very volatile. We, we dropped 5 $6 in two days, and then it rallied 10 So a lot of that volatility in there could have been some of that, but the index has not moved that much. It, it may be slated to move more. We've got several uh, hogs and pigs reports that show lower breedings and lower hogs kept on farms. So we know that we're whittling it down a little bit, but not by that much. All right. All right. Angie, I have a question that came in via Twitter. Imagine that something came in via Twitter <laughs> for you. Uh, Matt in Holyoke, Colorado wants to know, when considering marketing the 22 crop, should a farmer be thinking seasonality? For a couple of years in a row, I've had a cash price at or after harvest better than I could have gotten the spring before. Are the old ways out with this new world? And you can use any commodity you want to answer Matt's question. Yeah, I mean, I said it the other day in conversation, I've been doing this now for 17 years, and this is the fourth new price paradigm. And so I'm sure Chris can, can agree that, you know, we tend to run into these situations where, you know, nothing's going to be the same again. And suddenly we're back to, you know, here's your new boss, same as the old boss. I mean, honestly, I think at these levels with the amount of risk that you're laying out to spend on putting a crop in, if you've already invested in fertilizer, you've already invested in seed, you've already invested in chemicals, whatever, you know, you're, if you're long a crop, you, you definitely want to be making sure that, that you're at least covering the cost or the cash that you're trying to outlay to a certain extent. I'm not saying you have to liquidate everything by any means. And I'm not saying that you may not see 
uh, prices higher after harvest. You know, it's part of the reason that you build grain bins and you figure out ways to kind of uh, maximize your, your revenue in, in that regard. Um, but yeah, I, I would say at this point in time, well, it is something, you know, to pay attention to, be aware of, and, and kind of try to figure out how you can use to your advantage. It's not necessarily something I would say needs to, you know, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's certain marketing things and, and tools that have worked throughout all years, even if you may have missed the high last year. And so you want to make sure that you don't get so overzealous or so, you know, stuck in a mindset of of uh, punishing yourself for last year's mistakes that you okay. don't do anything this year. Angie Setzer, thank you so very much. Chris Swift, thank, thank you. you as well for your time. We'll keep this conversation going because this will do it for the installment of the TV show we call Market to Market. We're going to keep going in Market Plus, answer a lot of your questions, join us there. Find that on our website of markettomarket.org. And several schools started new semesters this week, and you can too in our Market to Market classroom. We have modules on innovation, entrepreneurship, and the 1980s farm crisis available at markettomarket.org slash classroom. Next week, we look at the push for voluntary electronic identification in cattle. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing. Store now. Profit later. Tomorrow. For over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.